Today, I'm with Julia Grace. Julia is not only an actor, she's also a writer, producer, director, and a teacher. She teaches the Meisner technique, and we'll be talking about that today. Welcome, Julia. Thank you. I really love that we're matching, Leslie. We are, aren't we? Well, you've, you've got more of a petrol blue than... No, I think mine's a bit petrol blue. I know, it's very good. Yes, yes. I like it. Yeah. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Julia, I'd love to start by finding out how you got into acting in the first place. Uh, this is one of those questions where I, I go, do I, do, I go, do I go the highly personal route or do I just keep it clean? Which do you want? The personal or the, the clean route? Oh, I think we want the personal. Yeah, that's what mm. I thought you'd say. <laughs> um, I had no one to play with at lunchtime when I was in year three or whatever. Uh, on Thursdays, specifically mm. Thursdays. So I said to everyone, where are you? Where is everyone gone? And they said, well, we're at drama. It's like, oh. oh, okay. So of course I went home and said to my parents, I need to go to drama. I have no one to play with. Um, and the first day that I went, they were casting for the play, King Midas and the Golden Touch. And so the instructions were to get up and um, pretend to be a king. So I picked up a ruler and started ordering everyone around and hammer, you know, <laughs> and lo and behold, I got the lead role. Um, and I remember, I remember being in the school hall where it was performed and sinking to my knees because I'd just touched my daughter, right? That's the story. This was many years ago. So that's the story. <laughs> he touches his daughter and she turns to gold because he's so greedy. Uh -huh. So I remember sinking to my knees, lamenting the fact that I had just inadvertently killed my daughter. Uh, that, that's a moment that stays with me. And then my parents afterwards going, who is, what happened to our daughter? Who is this? And people coming up to me going, <laughs> wow, that was, I think I was a, quite a shy child maybe. I don't know. Memory gets in the way, doesn't it? It does sometimes, yeah. You know, it's constructed. But um, so that's how I started because it seemed to come naturally, but I guess also because I got praise for it. Mm. Um, so did you continue on because you were quite young? Yes, I was like eight years old or something. Yeah. I did, but then I didn't get the lead role again. Oh. I got like downgraded. That's no good. And I thought, this isn't fair. <laughs> I'm an eight-year-old. Suddenly I get my first main role and I'm just a diva. Yeah, I got really good into like a chorus role or something. Um, but I continued on. Then I, did, then I did drama outside of school where I met a lot of people that I still know today. So wow. I was about 15 when I did that. Oh. Um, and then, you know, I, I did drama at high school. Okay. One of, one of the best productions I've ever done. I do remember it really fondly, um, was How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying when I was 16. That's Neil Simon, isn't it? No, 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 no. Because it was at the boys' school down the road oh. and I got to go to the boys' school mm. and meet all the boys. And um, I was playing Hedy LaRue. And mostly, this is the thing, a lot of private schools have more money than a lot of theatre companies. So I had, I had my own makeup artist. I had a, a, a lapel, like I had a mic and everything. There was a set, there was, I had my own wig. I mean, it was just incredible. So that was like my first real big production. Yes. And it was so fun. And because I'd gone in saying, I can't sing, just so you know, there'll be no high notes. So it was great. The character I played, um, it totally worked for me to sing awfully. And I did every single night and I took pride in it. <laughs> So that was so fun. And then I went to university um, because, <laughs> well, my parents were like, you need to go and do a degree, an actual degree, which was arts okay. at Sydney University. Um, but as well as doing the degree, what I was mostly doing was hanging out at Suds, which was the Dramatic Society. And I was there at a time when there were a lot of amazing people there who are now huge, amazing, successful theatre people in Australia. So mm. I was really lucky. Mm. It's funny how those things happen, isn't it? Yeah. You get groups of people that are all just kind of there at the time. That's right. That's mm. right. And then while I was doing that, I was also doing shows at ATYP, which is 
um, which is the Australian Theatre for Young People. Okay. Um, so I was doing shows there, doing uni, and then when I finished that three years, that's when I thought, ah, oh, I guess I'll try out for drama school. Um, and I, <laughs> I, I tried out for NIDA and Whopper and VCA. I mostly wanted to go to Whopper because it was the furthest away from Sydney okay. and I was in escapism mode. I was like, I want to get as far away from, you know, all these people as I can. Um, I'm lying. One particular person, an ex. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to get out of there. And then I didn't get in. I got shortlisted and I didn't get in. Huh. And um, I remember actually ringing Chris Edmonds saying, because by that time I'd been accepted to VCA and I rang him and said, look, <laughs> where I just want to, you know, I, you are my first choice and I, and I haven't got a phone call. He's like, ah, oh, Julia Grace looking down the list. I'm imagining I'm on the phone to him. He's like going through papers going, no, oh, you're pretty far down the list. Mm. It's like, oh, okay, no problem. Oh, I'll just accept the other one. But again, I ended up going to VCA, meeting an amazing group of people there who are very dear friends of mine now. I mean, it, it is funny how things work. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. So um, that was, that, that's at least, you know, the early years mm. condensed. Mm. And you then started getting roles pretty well straight away, didn't you, out of VCA? No, Leslie. Oh, I'm wrong. You're so wrong. Oh. You couldn't be more wrong, Leslie. Oh, I see. <laughs> no, this is what happened. I, um, I graduated and then nothing happened. Uh-huh. And I thought, oh, mm. God. Oh, God. I'm, I don't know. Ooh. And uh, I think in the three years that I had graduated, I'd done one commercial. And that was it. Okay. Oh, and like a, and a play. One, one commercial and one play. And I thought, oh, dear. Oh dear. And then a play came to town called August Osage County. And it was actually the MTC version, not even the Steppenwolf version. And I remember I was sitting in the front row watching this play and I was just floored by it. I was like, what? The, what? This is like an amazing soap opera on stage. And the fact that it had two intervals that I didn't mind. Mm. I mean, when you go to theatre and you hear those two intervals, it's like, come on. I mean, that's that's not on. Um, but as soon as the thing finished, because Robin Nevin was playing um, Violet, and as soon as it finished, everyone just leapt to their feet. Mm. There was no question. It was just standing over it. Yep, yep, everyone stands. And then I was talking to a friend afterwards. He said, well, you know that Steppenwolf you know, they're a theatre company in Chicago. It was made for them by one of their ensemble members who wrote it, blah, blah, blah. And they have a residency program. And I was like, okay, well, at that point I was edging towards my late 20s and I still hadn't travelled. And I thought, mm -hmm. that'd be a good excuse. I could travel. Very good excuse. And, and go and work with this amazing company. So I auditioned and I got in. Did you audition here or you had to go over there? No, you can audition from Australia. Okay. So you send in an application and then if you get through to the audition round, then you send through a taped audition, which in itself was quite interesting because after taping my audition, I had a car accident, a quite a bad car accident, um, where I wrote off two cars. Oh no. My own and the one I crashed yeah. into. Um, and that was on the way to choose the take to send to Steppenwolf. Because I think that's, that's what happens when you apply to things, doesn't it? You do it at the last yes. minute. Yes. So it had to be decided that day to be sent off in time. Um, and, you know, no one was hurt or anything. Um, but I got there and I was so shaken from this car accident that I kind of looked at them and went, oh... And I saw the one where I stuffed up. I completely dried in the middle of my take. And I went, send that one. <gasps> and, uh, you know, while I wouldn't recommend it, <laughs> I believe it was because 
It's the same thing with um, eating on stage, kissing on stage. You can't fake it. And when you see something go wrong on stage, as an audience member, you tend to lean forward because that person wasn't meant to drop that glass. We can all see that. So now we're watching truth on stage and that makes people lean forward. So I think intuitively, even with my shakenness from having a massive car accident, I saw in that, oh, that's honest. <laughs> that's someone who doesn't know what they're doing anymore. And then somehow getting back on track, send that one. And I got in, so. Again, I don't think I'd recommend it. Um, <laughs> I don't think, yeah, but uh, yeah, and then I went and had an amazing 10 weeks, which absolutely changed my life and my acting. Mm, I can imagine it would have. Yeah. It must have been extraordinary. And it, you know, it was the first time that I'd been in America, you know, and of course yeah. Chicago. Yeah. And I remember getting off, um, for people who haven't been to Chicago, they have an elevated train line getting off the L and walking underneath um, so coming down off the tracks and, and walking on the street underneath and then a train going overhead my first thought was oh wow you could get murdered under one of these no one would ever know I get that because they are so it's deafening it's deafening the L trains um, I'm used to it now but I remember that being one of my first impressions going yeah. whoa that is loud but yeah it was it was amazing. We had an amazing group of people um, that I was studying with who, again, I'm still very close with a lot of them. And, you know, St Steppenwolf as a place is, is all right. They're pretty good people. You know, they're an okay bunch to hang around. I bet they are. Yeah. Yeah. This was a 10-week summer school that Steppenwolf does every year. That's right. Okay. Yeah. What's the program? Uh, it is, so it's about 8.30 till 6 every day, or well, five days a week. Um, the core subjects are Meisner and Viewpoints. Mm -hmm. And then you also do Voice, Feldenkrais, um, and it will change each year depending on the ensemble members teaching. Uh -huh. Scene study, um, or text analysis, monologues. Sometimes there'll be on-camera components, sometimes there'll be Shakespeare components. Um, and then in the last three weeks you do ensemble scene study. So an outside director comes in and then you put up a scene. Mm. And how do you describe Meisner? I had never encountered it, encountered it before uh, going to Steppenwolf, which I think was a good thing because most of the cohort had. Uh -huh. And so I guess it would be fair to say when Meisner is taught as sort of a two or a three week little mm. tidbit at um, university, it's taught in a way that either doesn't make much sense or um, is confusing or I guess worst case scenario, just downright manipulative. Mm. Um, so people in my class are a little bit nervous. Well, either that or they were nervous because Amy Morton was walking in the room <laughs> to teach us. And so not knowing what it was, I feel like the way I talk about it now is when you say, what is Meisner? I immediately think, oh, it is the reason that I can connect with someone and listen without my mind taking over. Uh -huh. Now, of course, there is a book <laughs> where you can read in depth about it. And, and the technique itself was created by Sanford Meisner, who came out of the group theater. And th there is history to it. But when you ask me, what is Meisner, I think, it's something that tells my brain you can go on holiday for a bit and just let my impulses work. And you said viewpoint was something else that you that you learned at Steppenwolf Theatre. What's viewpoints? Um, so viewpoints, originally it was conceived by Mary Overly, who is a dancer choreographer, mm -hmm. um, and there were six of them. And then Tina Landau and Anne Bogart took those and expanded them to nine viewpoints. And Tina Landau and Anne Bogart are directors. So Anne Bogart has her own theatre company in New York, City Company, and she actually merged um, Suzuki training with okay. Viewpoints. And then Tina Landau is a Steppenwolf Ensemble member. So when she went to work with Steppenwolf, she introduced that to the ensemble there. Um, so they were the two core subjects, Meisner and Viewpoints. Um, 
So viewpoints is a like a, a movement based style of working? Yeah, I would say a, yeah, a movement based technique. And, and it seems to me that the reason it works well with Meisner mm. is that it enables you to work with your full body in the way that Meisner does in, in just having you just be very spontaneous. I would agree. Yeah, exactly. Um, so someone who you've just worked with, Audrey Francis, she had been to the school at Steppenwolf and because they're the two core subjects, I think for her, she'd found those very illuminating for her. And so she took Meisner and Viewpoints and went and started her own studio in Chicago, which is black box acting. And she really took what she'd learned at Steppenwolf and then ran, you know, um, not in a different direction, in the same direction, but I guess in a more cohesive way. Mm. So bringing them in and really gelling those two techniques together. Because as she talks about it, um, Meisner is um, viewpoints for the brain and viewpoints is Meisner for the body. But you're exactly right. Both techniques are demanding that you work off impulse and spontaneity. It makes sense that they're a good match. Mm. 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 You've now done a lot of teaching why did you get into teaching? You know, I, um, so I went to Steppenwolf as an actor. Yeah. And then I came back and I acted. <laughs> that's where I booked my roles, Leslie. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Not when I got out of drama school. No, when you got Meisner. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, well, the, actually the thing that I took away from Steppenwolf was, um, yes, all the techniques, but, but also the way they were taught. It was how they were taught that stuck with me. So I got back and I worked and... And what was that how? Well, I'm going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> uh, because I came back and I, and I worked, but I still felt like there was something missing. And so I was talking to a friend who said, well, what, what would you do if you could do anything? And I said, well, I would, I would go back and work out how they teach what they teach at Steppenwolf. And so at the time, Erica Daniels was the um, head of the school at Steppenwolf and also the casting director um, and artistic asso associate of Steppenwolf. And I wrote to her and said, I would you have me back to learn how to do what you do? And she said, yes. So um, I started going back and forth and learning from different ensemble members um, and artists that they had in teaching. Um, and I had said to Amy after I, Amy Morton, who I'd seen do Virginia Woolf on Broadway. So I'd seen the show and I'd seen her at stage door. Um, a group of her old students had come to see her. So she came to see us. And I said, and by the way, Amy, you know, if, you know, I would just really, I just really want to be you. I, th I think this is what I said to her. <laughs> She won't see this. It's like I think, I, Amy. I just want to. I just want to be you. You know. I just want to, um, like, um, you. You act and direct and um, teach and, uh, you know. I just. I just would love to do that. And you know, Amy is such a cool cucumber. And she just looked at me. She's like, okay. <laughs> but lo and behold, um, I got another email from Erica. I think six months later, saying, hey, so you know. Um, we loved having you here last summer and Amy would love you in her room next mm. summer. Mm. So of course I was like, yes, I'm coming, I'm coming. Great. Um, I'd always held on to that adage, which I think a lot of people do, those who can't mm. teach. Mm. Tell you what, you go to Steppenwolf, that doesn't hold. It certainly doesn't. It doesn't hold. No because you're surrounded by incredible artists who are engaged in acting, directing, writing, and teaching. And it's not about, um, you know, I'm, um, I, I, I'm powerless and so this is a way to get my ego fed. It's not about, uh, I'm bored of it, so I'll just do this to make a buck, no. These are people who are working out of generosity and who are interested in the art form continuing and evolving. So they want to share it. 
that's why it's an ensemble theatre company, right? Yeah. So it only makes sense that they would want to share how they do what they do. Yes. And this goes back to the why. They teach out of abundance. So you are constantly, you're, you're taken to task as an actor when you're studying there. They will push you to go further um, and to improve, of course. Mm -hmm. But you are consistently told you are enough. You are enough. Every day, you are enough. But also, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Don't do that. But you are enough. Right. Being taught out of abundance instead of scarcity and being taught out of generosity and the willingness to share and for the community to grow stronger, that's why that adage doesn't hold when you're in that kind of community. Mm. And that's something when you're teaching that really strikes very strongly for me is that you celebrate when we fail. It's a good thing. If we get up there and we really mess up, you just are so excited and pleased. Yeah. Yes. Because, you know, that never happens in life. No one celebrates you when you fail in life. Yeah. Least of all yourself. And then you spend the next day, week, month beating yourself up about it. Oh, yeah. So if you already do that in your real life, there is no room for it in the acting room on stage or on set, really. I guess you could get some things wrong. I mean, you might miss your mark and so the DP is going to get annoyed because they're going to have to refocus. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But in terms of the acting stuff, yeah. no, because if you failed, it means that um, you haven't been thinking things through. And I don't want to watch actors who think their way through a scene. I want to watch actors who live their way through a scene or a play mm. Mm. or a TV show, film, whatever it might be. Mm. I think also there's a thing for me certainly about needing to feel like I'm getting it right. Mm. And that was something that I really picked up when I did some work with Carol Rosenfeld last year. And I suddenly realised this isn't a test. No. She's not up there grading what I'm doing. It is absolutely about trying something and then trying something different. And it's a different headset that you then, I think, take onto the floor. And that's very much one of the things that I find working with you, is that you are celebrating that different headset. You know, from age five, there is. There is a right way to do things, there's a wrong way to do things. It's just inherent in at least Western society, right? There's a right way and there's a wrong way. That's right, exactly. In learning environments, I should say. Of course, we all know morally and ethically yeah. what is right and wrong, but yeah. in learning environments, um, two plus two is always going to be four, and if you write five, that is wrong. It's just wrong. <laughs> yes. Mm. So this need to get things right is... Also, I'm going to throw out there, probably a need for validation. Yes, absolutely agree. So that's where it comes back to the, the learning environment I experienced at Steppenwolf was, yeah, you are enough. The minute you can get over this wrong, right thing and know that everything you are is enough and you don't need to perform through something, show me something, prove that you're interesting, once you get that top layer of gunk off, then I can actually see you then I can actually learn from you. Mm, that's really powerful. Yeah. Julia, I'm going to shift gears and ask you yeah. about a piece of theatre that you're creating at the moment. Yeah. So this is a one-woman show with a man yeah. that you have... It's actually a turtle, Leslie. Oh. It's a turtle. OK. So you have devised this piece mm -hmm. and produced it. Yeah. Why did you want to create your own piece of theatre? A few reasons. One, uh, any acting work that I've done in the last few years has been mostly screen stuff. And so I wanted to know what it felt like to be in the room where I can smell the people watching me. Two, I have, I have always written. I've always been a writer. Okay. So um, probably... You know, when I was doing King Midas back in grade three or whatever it was, 
I was also bringing in a detective story that I was writing installments of uh -huh. and reading new installments every week to the class <laughs> in which everyone I'd made a character in that oh, installment. <laughs> so I was already doing that as a child. Um, and I am <laughs> very bad at discipline. So unless I have a date, Julia, people are watching you on stage, I will not finish writing anything. So I thought, oh, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll lock that in so I have to finish the piece. Thirdly, you know, why not? Why, why not? It might even be fun. Who knows? So what's it about? Yeah, great. It's about a woman who finds a turtle that she believes is her ex reincarnated. So her ex has just died. And it's through the relationship that she has with this turtle that, um, the fact that she has a phobia is uncovered and actually the reason why they broke up in the first place has a lot to do with that phobia. It is a dark comedy. It's funny, but dark. Like chocolate cake. <laughs> I think that's good. Great. <laughs> I think that's really good. Nailed it. I think you did. Uh, it is at the um, Fringe Hub in the parlour room, which is a tiny little room. Uh, at the North Melbourne Town Hall. The last part that I'd really like to talk about mm. is your directing. Mm. So can we start with how do you describe the role of a director? I actually find the title of director weird. For me, for me. Because um, the thing I'm most interested in if I'm directing is still the actors, just like if I were teaching. It's still what's happening with the actors. And so in terms of directing, that really is a big picture role. I have to know if the story is being told in a way that is accessible, that is the story that the playwright has written um, or the screenwriter has written. Um, when sometimes all I care about the most is the acting, which I don't think is a wrong thing. I don't think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bad thing because often you'll go to the theatre or you'll see something where the acting is n has not been the priority. Because also, especially in Australia, there are short rehearsal periods, which means a director may not have the time to work with actors on the acting stuff. They have to take care of the big picture. Mm. So for me, all I care about is acting goodness. So how do you What's the distinction for you then between the work you do as a teacher and the work you do as a director? Probably very little, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. I remember having someone that was on set with me that said, ah, oh, the way you run a set is just like a room. I was like, well, it's because I'm only, I'm only ever really looking for one thing. Do I believe you? And if I don't, how can I help work with you so that I do? Mm. That's, that's kind of what I'm looking for. So I don't, I don't really uh, distinguish between the two, apart from things like looking at the shot or mm. I mm. guess looking at the type of furniture that's being used or the costuming, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What, what's next for you? Where do you see yourself in the next few years? Wow taking over the world, Leslie, <laughs> taking over the world. Um, I, you know, I am really lucky to be doing what I love mm. and I don't take that for granted. Um, so I guess what I would love to do is create more because as I said, it, it, I'd been doing a lot of screen stuff and also other people's stuff, mm. but it really is such fun creating your own work and working with people. Um, so a friend of mine, Morgana O'Reilly, is directing me in this play that I've written. But she's a fabulous actor and maker and director as well. And when you find those people that you really gel with, I mean, again, you look at Steppenwolf Theatre Company yeah. and they're an amazing theatre company because they've found people they can work with well. Yeah. And like any, any duo, you know, you see yeah. Gina Riley and Jane Turner, like yeah. Magda, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. it's because they work well. So I think I want to put my creating hat on more mm. in the next five years, as well as taking over the world. <laughs>
So is it hard to juggle between acting, teaching and directing? Um, not in terms of picking up different tools. Mm. The picking up and putting down of tools is easy. I guess it's when the line is blurred between the role you're playing. And when you're trying to do at least two of them at the same time. Yes. Stuff as well. That's true. That's yeah. true. But I guess, uh, yeah, for me, I guess it, it's maybe oversimplifying it in some ways. But honestly, the thing that makes me lean forward is when I see truth and authenticity on stage. So I'm going to try my best to do that when I'm acting. I'm going to do my best to find that in people when I'm teaching them or foster that in people when I'm teaching them. And the same in, in the directing role as well. So I guess it sounds in a way it can be quite rudimentary and oversimpli I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying things, but, and there is a lot more that goes on with acting, I know. But if you haven't got that down, then everything else is just ideas. And I can think about ideas by myself. I don't need to go to the theater to see them being thrown at me. Mm. And I mean ideas of what it means to be in a relationship, be a murderer, be a woman, um, you know, coercing a husband into murder, whatever those big plays are about. Yeah. If you haven't got truth down, I don't want to see ideas being performed at me. Yeah. That's a great place to end, I think. Thank you so much, Julia. It's been a fabulous conversation. You're so welcome. <laughs> I've been with Julia Grace. Thank you for watching.